So talk about that with your 2008 Olympic four, because you came into that Olympic season on the back of a fourth place. You missed a medal in the World Championships in Munich. Um, that was in the crew with um, yourself and Alex Partridge, Pete Reed, and um, Stevie Williams, was it? Stevie Williams, yeah, yeah, Stevie. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so where did where did leadership from within the crew happen for that Olympics in 2008? Um, well, <laughs> uh, we, we took our inspiration from a few sources. Um, we had uh, sort of guest guest appearances from people like Johnny Sinkfield in that 2008 boat. Uh, and he was, he was, he, he sort of really gave us something slightly different to hang on to, um, technically, which brought the boat together. Uh, Remember what it was. What, I mean, what was what? What did you bring to you? <laughs> it was a specific thing around the catch. It was a uh, it was a patience in the water sort of component where we did some exercises where we'd you know just place the blade and let the boat push the blade back just for a fraction of a second, and it sort of took away that that emergency out of the first inch, and it actually sort of developed this idea in my head that actually you know the way the way the, the the blades are moving at that angle within a boat it's so easy to sort of smash the front end and overload it um especially in the smaller boats it's something i had to move away from when we sort of got into the eights and things but um that patience to sort of let the boat keep running and almost just hang on the rebound with your knees it's a really lovely feeling when it gets right and it's when it's in a crew and the boat just just finds an ease uh, a sort of a compassion a you know a real um a real harmony yeah. with all those sort of different com combinations of um of, of the water and the boat mass the body mass of us the ability for your muscles to rebound very naturally without actually much power and then actually that gave us the freedom to really smash the middle of the stroke, which is always quite nice. Um, what, what other what other leaderships did you have? You, you know, other factors. You talked of, of, of Johnny Singfield who came and did some coaching with you. Uh, what else? Well, obviously, you know, Steve Williams, uh, his experience in the sport was huge. And I think it took a, a, a while. <laughs> Cheers, Chris. <laughs> um it took us a while to, um, I think, to sort of really understand his experience. Um, and we, we sort of, I think that that weight of his experience and knowledge coming from Athens was considerable. Uh, obviously, it was a huge maturing time for myself, um, you know, to go from this annoying, you know, probably relatively arrogant, uh, sort of oath you know who's usually restricted to the four seat in an eight uh or three seat how i ended it uh, in my career but um you know there was a lot of development for all of us and i think by the time we got to to beijing we had we'd all taken big steps forward and then you know pete with his role with doing the calls um pete did the calls in that race did he did he no, Steve did, didn't he? No, yeah. TJ. Yeah. Oh God, I can't remember. TJ was in the bow seat. I think it was. No, I'm getting confused. I think because Pete did the course for London. Yeah. Um. But there was, you know, there was there was a lot of development. But you know, I think what we proved by the end of the that campaign was the sort of the the, the tenacity of our crew and actually our 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 sort of our arrogance to stick to our plan and even with the Aussies all credit to them putting together a race plan which was I, I, I'm guessing designed to, to sort of break us mentally to make us split you know I think they would, would sort of relatively soundly beat them in the heat or the semi and we had done, done it from behind so I think their, their, their thought was well let's just leave them for longer let's just make yeah. sure we really punish them and, and make them question themselves and you know, going into sort of 1500 meters, 
best part of half to a length down on these Aussies, you know, in the stroke seat, I couldn't see their stern. And we've got 500 meters to go of this, you know, my second Olympics and my first in the lead boat. It was sort of, you know, we, we got to that point in 100% confidence. And I think, oh, yeah, like there was no question that we were going to overtake them. It was just a case of, hang on a minute, I think we should have done that by now. Um, and then going through the 500 as the as this noise from the crowd starts to elevate, it was it, it was a fantastic it's a fantastic moment because it kind of demonstrated, you know, in the training sessions you do the sort of, you know, you do your starts, 15 strokes, you do your sort of middle 500s, you do your thousands, and you to so 2k at race pace, and then you do your sprint for the line and you sort of start up at 36 and you up to up to but you only do it for 500 meters and it's it's sort of all in isolation and then the idea is that on the race day you put it all together and you take the best bits of each but then there's always that big question of you know okay a sprint finish off of doing your first 1500 meters full whack is never going to be like training right <laughs> but I think one thing I found out on that day was, you know, when you got the sense of occasion, when you got the adrenaline pumping through your body and you got the crowds cheering, you got your parents in the stands, you got all that weight, what that does biologically, the doors it opens through adrenaline, yeah. through passion, desire, and that, that willingness to hurt yourself to really dig deep and actually, you know, throw caution to the wind and just go all in. As we went into that last 500 and the call started being made and that urgency becoming real, what we were able to do was just mind-blowing and just understanding where we'd come from in training and what we actually did. And I think I do have to give a bit of credit to the Aussies. While we definitely pushed up and up and up into realms we only experience in short pieces i think the aussies you know had you know cooked their beans and m may have given us a slight illusion of us yeah. accelerating but then maybe not these not accelerating either as much or maybe even decelerating a bit as they realized that we were sort of going through um but it did make for an amazing crowd pleaser of an event um to sort of you know the commentary i think it was Obviously, yours is brilliant, Crossy. <laughs> but uh, I think it was, uh, what was it? Um, uh, I think it was the Radio 5. There's, there's some stuff. It was just amazing. To, to be part of that, you know, that's a real buzz. That's a, yeah. that's Roger, I want to take you to, you know, an interesting period in your life, which I, I don't know if you've had a chance to reflect on, you know, more distance from it, but the years when you did the pair with Pete, you know, you were the fastest British pair, you were Olympic champions. You know, and you, you came up against these two oarsmen from New Zealand. And I remember the first time you raced actually in Munich. I think you led them off the start and, and they rode through. You did about 134 first 500. What, what are your reflections on, on those years of, of racing them in the pair and, you know, finishing in the silver medal position? Uh, and how, how hard was it for you? What, what do you think of it now? Uh, so I think. The reason we went into the pair was to was kind of a voyage of, of discovery. Uh, both Pete and I felt we've kind of earned the chance to ask. Um, you know, we'd been pretty dominant on the domestic scene and we thought, you know, start of a new Olympiad, let's try something new. And uh, part of that was a personal desire to explore different parts of the sport. Um, <laughs> I have this annoying habit of as soon as I find a comfortable zone, smashing it to pieces and <laughs> trying, to, trying to either find something new or different or, and it's, it, it's a voyage of discovery, right? It's, you gotta, you gotta break something that works um, to, to be able to rebuild it and find out where the cracks were and, and find, make it better. And the going into the pair was, was a, a lot of that it was really to sort of, stress ourselves as as ambitious young athletes and find out where we could go um and the journey turned out to be much more stressful than uh, than i had 
ever imagined. Um, hey, I'm, I'm really proud of the racing we did. I think we had some fantastic um, some races. I think some of the training stuff we did was just amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the sort of fairy tale dream stuff where, you know, paddling out in a, a viz again, uh, just this amazing location in Portugal. But, you know, A, it's a massive long bendy lake. So I used to steer around all the corners and I used to love that sort of component of breaking free and just, you know, exercising the steering foot uh, in a nice way. But also, as a pair with that motivation behind us, we were just there were moments when, you know, I don't know if people really know what the sort of normal speeds are for a pair, but so gold medal, gold medal percentage time for UT2 was, I think, somewhere like 203, yeah. 204, and that sort of top end tailwind. And on still days, you know, when everything worked, we were sort of 157s, 156s, and it just felt just felt so slick, so easy and just commanding. It was just a magnificent time. But, you know, we, we only got there because we knew the challenge ahead of us. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the points, or one of the things I tried to achieve in rowing was always to try and get Jürgen to stand in front of the ergo or in the boat and be like, OK, guys, that's fast enough. Slow down, <laughs> you know. To get him to kind of pull on the reins a bit to say, okay, that's enough. You know, I'd much rather that than come on, you're not going fast enough. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, he'd sort of call out, you know, from his boat launch um, on those sessions, and be like, yeah, like 157s. He'd be like, oh guys, come on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so no, we had some amazing moments in that pair, and it, it was, you know, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about rowing a pair. Um, I learned a lot about Pete. <laughs> yeah. uh, spent a lot of time together with that poor guy. Um, you know, public apology to the big man. Sorry for all that. <laughs> um, but it, it certainly was a big component of, of what we then did in London. It was a big component of, um, uh, of you know how I developed for the next four years and it was probably a big component of why I had to take a year out in you know 2015 16 and why I was able to say you know goodbye to the sport at the end of 2016 so happily because my body was absolutely broken <laughs> so Andy you know those years are important going into 2012 uh, 2012 was an interesting season for you. I, I remember, you know, you came up against this amazing Australian crew with Drew Ginn in it, and um, you raced them in, in Munich, and they beat you. And um, it was a bit of a journey between Munich and the London Olympics. Um, how instrumental were people in the crew like Alex Gregory or TJ or yourself or Pete Reid in, in sort of turning that around to putting you in a gold medal position for London? Well, um, well, I think, first of all, I think it's Jürgen's kind of plan. He was always intent on his lead boat losing the last World Cup before an Olympic Games. <laughs> I think if you look back through the Pinsington Red Grave era, it was a sort of bit of a similar trait. Yeah. I was never sure if it was like a bit of blue tack on the bottom of the boat or... <laughs> but it, 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 it does what it needed us to do, which was fire us up for the last you know, month and a half before the Olympics to hit that silver at training camp with everything and then have that focus and determination that would last us right through the wind down camps. And as your body recovers and you sort of have that temptation to do other things because you've got a bit of energy, it keeps you deadly focused knowing that your last race, you came second. Yeah. Um, so I think it was kind of a bit of Jürgen's master plan, but the guys in that crew, you know, <laughs> I raced with TJ way back uh, from 2003. I think he stroked the eight for the first time when we got that first bronze. Bronze in Milan. In Milan, yeah. Oh, that was a brutal race. <laughs> um, massive headwind, absolutely gut wrencher. But anyway, um, you know, and then we raced each other in the boat race and then 
you know, we had obviously Beijing, you know, seeing him develop and, and, and understanding kind of his strengths. Uh, you know, he would purport to be kind of one of the least powerful guys, but each and every time, you know, he was called upon, you know, you, you could feel the boat move, you know, you could feel what he could do. Um, and there was a huge kind of sense of responsibility on my shoulders because he's the stroke guy, right? Or certainly from, from my perspective, he was always in the stroke seat. So to be put in front of him with their kind of his, his, his sort of kind of almost psychologically breathing down my neck, you know, am I getting this right? Am I doing exactly what we said we were going to do? Am I doing my job as a stroke man here? Because I can't let them down. Yeah. Um, and having that right there was was huge. Obviously, you know, Pete, uh, the one thing I like about Pete was that we kind of fit each other really nicely. His strengths are my weaknesses and my weaknesses are his strengths. And that means he's got a lot of strengths. <laughs> but he... Um, uh you know just the the biggest brother in arms you could ever want to wage war on anyone else and then you know greg is he's one of the most unique rowers i know um to to say he's he's kind of timid is the wrong word but he's not that sort of gung-ho broadsword waving you know his skill is well. If we want to go into broadswords, he's like the um, the elves in uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, yeah. I mean, Lord of the Rings. You know how they're how majestic they are, and they just do things so effortlessly. And you know, three bows, one arrow, three arrows with one bow, three orcs. You know, it's it's that. <laughs> Sorry to go a little mystical on you, but you know, he he has this incredible manner um, of, of of the team he's in building that team, giving them support, asking the right questions. But the technical, the physical skill, you know, he brings to the boat. And all those bits align perfectly because we were kind of facing the Steve Redgrave for the Aussie team. Yeah. It was Drew Ginn's final year. Uh, it was his swung song. You know, it became painfully apparent on the finish line when we have been presented with the medals by the Australian IOC representative. You know, he was he he was their their guy that year. Yeah. Um, you know, could you imagine the Italians of beating Red Grave in Sydney? That would have been just it would have broken so many hearts and minds of what was possible. You know, would obviously never hold it against a big guy, but you know, it, it meant a great deal to them. Um and that I think that that sort of set the standard of what we're up against. You know, it wasn't just a whippy young Aussie crew from Beijing who, you know, weren't didn't make the eight and just happened to discover a crew that was really good. You know, these are the this is the real deal. This has got vast amounts of experience, vast amounts of power, and it would take only the best to to beat it. Um, and you know, again, I kind of remember the every step of that fall was a voyage of discovery right up until the sort of the, the day after the rep uh, the the semi when we were talking about how we were going to beat these aussies and jürgen was like look you just got to worry about the first 1500 you know you just gotta you gotta not let them get a sniff you want them to keep your bows in front the whole way and i remember sort of thinking like okay so we've got to commit to the first 1500 like it means everything. That's what it's going to take to stay in front of them. And then we're like, well, what about the last 500? How do we, what yeah. do we plan for that? How do we think about that? And he was like, just don't. Just trust what you can do. Trust in what's going to happen, that the last 500 will take care of itself. You just make sure you stay ahead every stroke of the first 1500. And, you know, that was quite a challenge for the crew because, we all like to have a good plan. We all like to understand how it's all going to fit together and result in your hundred percent on the finish line. And suddenly there's like a 500 meter hole just sitting right there at the sharp end of the event. But we kind of, 
took that leap. We took that leap of faith and we committed to the race. And, you know, the Aussies had always led us off the start. They'd always led us through a thousand and we'd always kind of come back. Yeah. But we kind of took Jürgen to his word and we committed to the front end of the race. Um, we didn't let them get in front. I think it was about half a length. I think the closest they got to was about a canvas going into the last 400. Uh, it was it was a sublime row. It was yeah. it was the it was the best bits. That first eight fifteen hundred were the best bits of our training. But then, as the crowd came into its own, you know, as you go into that cauldron of noise from the thirty thousand people at Dorney that day, again, you you realise stuff that you didn't think was really possible. The the sort of you know the magic. 50 strokes at a stupid speed in training it there was nothing nothing was going to stop that from reappearing after those 1500 meters in front of that crowd um, yeah. and, and we we stuck again just a bit like beijing we stuck together as a crew absolutely glued hanging on all the bit all the great bits of rowing we've done in training we had that belief in each other the commitment um and yeah, uh, uh, for me, it was certainly the biggest uh, stage of all the events. You know, your home Olympics. Yeah. Um, to do it once is tough, but to do it again, you know, the second one is is the is the, is, a, is a really tough one to break. Um, and then with such, you know, such esteemed opposition, um, yeah. yeah, it was it was really something cool.